the last chapter of the book of John, John chapter 21. Also, I want to introduce a new friend on stage, if you haven't noticed. I've got a friend here next to me. That's, uh, if you don't know, that uh, many people stream our services. They watch them live. We've also got other churches that this is their sermon, and uh, they have the misfortune or fortune, I don't know. They, they, we have to choose whether they're going to see the screen or they're going to see me, and so all the people watching on that line now just have to apologize. I'm included in all those shots now. And so, but anyway, this is for, for them, and, and just want you to know that if you are not able to come, you can stream online and you can, you can watch these. But anyway, so a new friend there. The other thing I just wanted to, to say is we're coming to a, a sad day. We've been in the book of John for 16 months now, and we've come to the last chapter. And so, This week and next week will be our last, and that's kind of a sad day, but it's been a great journey. I hope you've appreciated it. But if you do have your Bibles, the last chapter of the book of John, let's just start by reading John chapter 21, beginning with verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathan of Canaan, Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, two other disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work. He threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they're not far from the land, but about 100 yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. We remember the story, Jesus, of course, the death, burial, resurrection. Jesus has appeared twice already to the disciples, once in the upper room behind locked doors with Well, the disciples minus Thomas, and then a week later, again, behind locked doors, he appears to them, this time with Thomas. But now we find the disciples have returned to Galilee. That that really shouldn't surprise us for a couple reasons. First of all, they're Galileans, so they've gone home. They were in Jerusalem to really celebrate the Passover. But not only that, they've been instructed by Jesus to go back and return to Galilee. The, The message Jesus gave to the ladies was exactly that, that, that go tell the disciples uh, to go to Galilee. And so we read that in the book of Matthew. For example, uh, Matthew 28 says, Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and they'll see me. So they have really followed Jesus' instructions and they've gone there. We, we find there an interesting list of characters. The, the cast are at least seven of the apostles. It's interesting because we see Simon Peter there. We also see Thomas. It's good to see that Thomas now again is with the disciples. We we see Nathaniel. This is the first time since chapter one Nathaniel's been mentioned. We also see the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other disciples. Now, in all probability, this is Andrew. We get Peter and Andrew who are brothers, uh, James and John who are brothers, and also two that we always see listed together. We see Nathaniel and we see uh, 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 Philip together. And so those are probably the ones we have here, and we, we find them there. And as they're, they're there, Jesus is going to come and reveal himself to them in a very surprising way. Now, I want to say that again. Jesus is going to come reveal himself. I don't want you to miss that. In fact, I want you to notice your Bibles. If you do have those open, there's a word that I want you to look at. We've talked before that John is remarkably well written. It's also remarkably structured. And so we see all kinds of things in the book of John, uh, things like chiastic structures. Here I want to point out another technique. It's called an inclusio. That's simply brackets. And in this section, John has written this in bracket style, an inclusio style, where we find in verse 1 the purpose. And we're going to see that purpose. In fact, we're going to see it twice. We're going to see that he comes and reveals himself to that. And I'd probably even underline that word. We see in verse 1, after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. 
And so we see that word revealed. And again, jump down to the end, you'll see how the section's bracketed. And so when we get down to verse 14, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to disciples. So you see how that works? He starts and he ends the section. Here's the point he wants to make, and he said it very clearly. This is how Jesus revealed himself. The other thing we need to understand as we look at this passage, that word revealed, to manifest, to show, it's a very important word. It's a significant theological word. The language is usually reserved for God himself revealing himself to mankind. Uh, It's also used of Jesus saying, I'm the one that reveals God to you. And so it's used in this context of divine revelation to man and Jesus revealing God to us. And John is saying, look, I want to show you how Jesus has revealed himself to disciples. So we need to understand that's the purpose of this passage. Whatever else we do, however we get sidetracked by interesting terminology, we need to realize the purpose is this is Jesus revealing himself to the disciples, and that's exactly what we find. And so as we start our text, first of all, we see Jesus appearing to them. He's revealing his presence. He comes and he stands among them or stands on the shore and it's rather interesting. Actually, the terminology, again, suggests it's kind of magical. Of course, not, it's not a magic. It's, it's a miracle. It's mysterious how Jesus comes and he appears on the shore. It's really similar language to what he's done previously when he came. The disciples were behind locked doors and he appears to them there. And again, a week later, Thomas wasn't there the first time. Jesus comes again behind locked doors. He appears there while we see Jesus appearing before them. Now, let me back up again. The Guys have gone to Galilee, just like Jesus had instructed them. And they're waiting, and they're wondering, what do we do now? We don't know how long. Maybe it's a few days. Maybe it's even a few weeks. But they're there in Galilee. They're waiting. Jesus has told us to come here. Jesus hasn't showed up yet. And so they're sitting around. They're waiting. And perhaps there's this conversation. What do you think we should do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. And then Peter comes up with a bright idea. Hey, I'm going fishing. So he announces something very familiar and reliable. Let's go fishing. And all the guys say, yep, count us in. Now, when we talk about fishing, understand this is not hook and line. This is a boat and nets. They're going to go out just a short ways from shore and get some small nets they're going to cast from the boat. Normally, they go out and they put their boat parallel to the shore and you cast your net towards the shore. That's going to become important. The Sea of Galilee actually drops off rather quickly, and to catch fish with a net, you want to do it really closer to shore. And so they're going to go out there. They're going to go at night. That's common. It's most effective here in the Sea of Galilee for, their, uh, for fishing. They also want to catch fish at night and take them to the market when they're fresh in the morning. So they go out, but here's the problem. They're going to fish all night, and it's not going to be productive. Now, it's still probably beneficial in terms of fishing is going to supply them companionship and a diversion, some comfort of doing something they're familiar with. They they want food, but that's not going to happen. But it probably is a welcome relief. Just think about the last few weeks and everything they've gone through, the ups and the downs. And we realize it has been a roller coaster ride of events. We can go clear back and, and we can remember the, the parade into town and the triumphal entry and the Last Supper and everything that happens there. The, the sudden departure of Judas, one of their own that's left and betrayed Jesus. The arrest of Jesus at Gethsemane, the denials of Peter, the illegal trials, the crucifixion. Even the burial of Jesus in a borrowed tomb and certainly the resurrection. Exciting, but rather interesting. They've gone through all that, and so to go out and go fishing might be a welcome relief. Now, there are some people who have suggested that when they've gone back to finish fishing, they're actually abandoning Jesus' call. I want to stop and say there's no hint of that in our text. There's no indication that they've left Jesus or they're, they're uh, turning their backs on Jesus. In fact, actually, when Jesus comes, he doesn't scold them. He's actually going to bless their endeavor. And so Jesus comes, and at that point, he stands among them on the shore, but they don't recognize him. It's Jesus, but it's a hidden Jesus. It's a different Jesus. It's somehow a changed Jesus. And I want you to just kind of stop and think about this. All the appearances of Jesus after the resurrection We need to recognize they have this continued inability to recognize him by sight. It's Jesus. He still bears the marks of the crucifixion. He can point out his hands and his side. It's Jesus, but it's a different Jesus. It's somehow a changed Jesus. And some have suggested maybe this is the type of body that we'll have 
when we are resurrected to new life in heaven. But there's this continued inability to recognize Jesus. In fact, we can go back and remember Mary Magdalene when she's at the tomb. Jesus comes up behind her and she thinks it's the gardener. She doesn't recognize him until he speaks her name. She turns and then she discovers this is Jesus. Or we can read the account of two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus and Jesus actually comes and starts talking with them and they're prevented from seeing. They're unable to recognize him at first and then they realize this is Jesus. And now the disciples on the sea when Jesus is standing there, it's Jesus but at first They don't recognize him. It's Jesus, but it's a changed Jesus. It's a resurrected Jesus. It's a different Jesus. And so it's Jesus, but not quite the same Jesus. So he stands among them, and at first they don't get it. But then he comes and he reveals his provision to them. He takes care of their needs, really. You see, the disciples, uh, they have, have gone out all day, and they've had no luck. They've fished all night, and they've not caught anything. Well, Jesus comes and offers them breakfast. And they don't know at first it's Jesus. He's standing there on the shore, and he calls out, how's the fishing? Now, it's interesting, actually, when he says that, he uses some interesting language, including the word pideon, which the word pideon is used of a small child. Sometimes it's used of a slave in the household, but it's a diminutive word, a small household member. And really, as he calls out to them, here's the sense. Hey, kids. Hey, kids, have you caught anything? And what's remarkable is they simply answer, no. They, they admit their failure without any embellishment, which I think is a miracle in itself. I see you talk to most fishermen, you catch anything, and they've got an excuse, right? You should have seen the one that got away. Or they have all the excuses why they didn't catch anything, but here they just say no. And so he directs them to cast nets one more time, the opposite side of the boat, the deep side of the boat. Now, if they haven't had any luck on the shallow side, They know this. There's not going to be anything on the other side. Uh, He tells them to cast out their nets on the other side. And I just want to stop. Why reveal himself in this way? He could have revealed himself other ways. Hey, guys, it's me. Come here. I've got something to tell you. He could could have told them exactly who it is. But he's got something bigger, something grander, something better in mind. He wants to reveal himself. He wants to reveal himself in this way on purpose. And so, again, he calls them to cast out their net one more time on the opposite side away from shore, their small nets, he tells them that, and understand he's asking them to do something that's counterintuitive. By the way, these guys, before they came to Jesus, what they do for a living? They're fishermen. They know what they're doing. They know their task. Uh, they've done it well previously, and yet all night they've gone out and not caught anything, but Jesus tells them to cast their net on the other side, and we know what happens. It's a miraculous catch. Now, that's clearly stated four times in our passage. I don't know if you caught them all times, but all of them, but let me show them to you again. Four times we find out what happened. They're not able to haul in the catch. The net was completely full of fish. It was full of large fish. In fact, we get a count, 153. The net was full but not torn. John's stressing over and over and over again, this is a miraculous catch, and he tells us. And so we get the picture. This is not expected. This is remarkable. This is miraculous. Now, the the fish they catch, they're a perch-like fish, tilapia. Now, you need to understand that a good catch would be maybe a dozen or two. They don't get a dozen or two. They get 153. It's astounding. Also notice in in this passage These aren't small fish. Now, tilapia can be small. It can be a pound or even less. But the word that's used here is it's a large fish. In fact, in our passage, we're going to find he changes the language to say these are large fish. And what you need to understand is a large tilapia, they can be two to five pounds. Now, think about that. If just two pounds, that'd be uh, about 300 pounds or more of fish. If they're five pounds, that's more than 700 pounds of fish. This is a lot of fish. When Jesus provides, Jesus provides abundantly. A lot of fish. They can't even drag the net in. Remarkable thing is, so many, the net doesn't break. And I've got to, got to stop and say, I've got firsthand experience of tilapia. And my impression, St. Peter's fish, um, sorry, in fact, I've got a picture for you here. And people have been accusing me of saying this has been photoshopped. And I want to say it's not been photoshopped. That really is a St. Peter's fish there. You see the picture there? Actually, yes, I did at one point have hair. <laughs> it's your fault, I think. Um, I'm not, maybe you, maybe my kids, I don't know. But uh, 
remarkable catch of fish. John's experienced this before, remember? Actually, when Jesus calls the disciples early on in ministry, he does a very similar thing in Luke chapter 5. And so John, as this happens, John puts it all together. He knows who this is. He sees the miraculous catch. He knows this is the man Jesus. But I've got to stop and say, no, it's much more than that. And here's John's point. This Jesus, he's more than a man. This is is Jesus. And I want you to see what, what, what John says. He quickly relays to Peter, this is the Lord. That's that's key here. And you've got to stop. And again, if you're writing things in your Bible, you need to underline those words revealed, but you need to stop and underline this phrase. It is the Lord. You've got to hold on to that because that's John's purpose in writing here. It's the Lord. Now, as soon as he says that, he says it to Peter, and (laughs) Peter, he gets dressed. Now, by the way, he's not naked. He's got an inner robe and an outer robe. But he realizes it's the Lord, and so he puts on his outer robe. He wants to meet his Lord, and he wants to be appropriately dressed. And then he goes, and as I read this, it literally says he throws himself into the water. I picture, I don't know why, I picture this. I picture a belly flop, right? Because this is Peter. This is, this is Peter, and it's standard Peter. It's, it's classic Peter. We realize this is how Peter responds. And as you go through the Gospels, this is how he does respond. He's always the first one to act or speak or react. He's the one, when Jesus comes walking on the water, he's the first to climb out on the boat, of the boat and, and try to walk on the water. He's the one that offers when Jesus is transfigured. He's saying, hey, I'll build three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He's the one that refuses to let Jesus wash his feet at the, at the Last Supper. Not my feet, Lord. And Jesus says, hey, unless I wash your feet, you have no part of me. And then Peter says, well, bring it on. Wash all of me. And Jesus says, no, just your feet's enough, Peter. But it's classic Peter, right? He's the one that's going to strike out with a sword and take off Malchus's ear. He's the one that's going to deny after boasting. Even if everybody else denies you, I never will. And that very night, three times, he'll deny Jesus. This is classic Peter. He's the one that's going to have a foot race, and although he's beaten by John, when he gets to the tomb, he barges right through, right into the empty tomb. And so this is classic Peter. He throws himself out of the boat, and he swims to shore. Now, the truth of the matter is they're not very far away, and it appears that the other disciples get there about the same time. So it doesn't really do him that much good, but he's seen Jesus. They understand the remarkable provision, the miraculous catch of fish, and they're going to see Jesus. And at that point, we get to the the center part of this passage, where Jesus is going to reveal his lordship. This is who Jesus is. On shore, Jesus is going to prove again he is in control. He's in charge. And we realize there that they, they, they ask something strange, or they don't ask something. They know it's the Lord, but none of them says, who is this? Interesting phrase, and we'll talk about that. Jesus, as they get there, he's ready with this charcoal fire. He's ready with some bread and fish. By the way, a couple small fish and some loaves remind you of a story. Reminds us of the miraculous, uh, the, excuse me, the feeding of the 5,000, or again, the feeding of the 4,000. Jesus also has done this before, but this time a unique twist. The feeding of the 5,000, a little boy brought his snack lunch, and Jesus multiplies that. But here Jesus provides both the loaves and the fish. He calls the disciples to bring fish also, but he's the one that's provided for them abundantly. Jesus has provided for their needs. And so here we find Jesus providing all of that. And I want to tell you, that's how Jesus operates. Without Jesus, they didn't have much luck. With Jesus, however, he provides for all their needs, and he does it abundantly. And so he invites them to breakfast, and then we get this strange, this strange phrase, They knew it was Jesus, but none of them dared ask. And I just want to stop and say, why why is that the case? What's going on here? They knew it was Jesus, but they didn't ask. There are some people who have attempted to translate this differently or give their own paraphrase. There are some who are saying, it's you. We know it's you, but is it really you? And there's kind of a hint of that. Again, I've got to stop and say, they know it's Jesus, but it's different Jesus. He's changed there. Uh, John's writing this on purpose, and there was this tension that's going on. I've got to stop and say, it's exactly right. Jesus has created a tension here by him being there. It's got profound implications. They know it's Jesus. Everybody knew it was Jesus, but it's a different Jesus. Jesus, you're changed. You're not quite the same. There's something different about you, and I've got to stop and say, yes, there is something different about Jesus. He has changed, and that's the point. He's revealing himself 
to them. Now, they've got glimpses of this before, like the transfiguration. Or a similar thing happened when Jesus calms the storm. They're out on the Sea of Galilee in great waves. Remember the story, right? And as Jesus comes, he simply speaks. He says, hush, be still. And the waters become perfectly calm. And they're saying, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? I'm telling you now, it's Jesus, but it's a different Jesus. It's a resurrected Jesus. It's a Jesus that he's not now in his incarnational state. This is Jesus again. And we realize this light bulb goes on. It's Jesus, but it's more than Jesus. This is their Lord, and, and John has already told us that. Now, this is a resurrection, but it's not a resurrection like Lazarus. You see, Lazarus was raised back to the same type of life that he had before. He was re raised to resume his same life, but Jesus is raised, and he's restored to his rightful place. It's Jesus, but it's so much more than the human Jesus. You need to realize they've been confronted with their Lord, their creator, their sustainer, their provider, their redeemer. This is Jesus, but much more than Jesus. Standing before them is the, the very one who spoke them into existence. Standing before them is the creator of the universe. And they're realizing it's Jesus, but nobody dared ask because they realized who this was. This is the Lord who had been providing for them. He's come to them, and they realize, and they give the proper response. He's Lord. And I want you to, again, stop, and I want you to kind of rewind what you might miss is this is John's point. Let's just go back to chapter 20 and again turn the page into chapter 21. And you're going to say, see this phrase. It's the repeated rephrase, phrase. It's the repeated confession of faith. And so just notice those two chapters. For example, Mary Magdalene, when she sees Jesus, she doesn't recognize him first. She thinks he's the gardener. Remember her response? I've seen the Lord. Jesus appears to the disciples behind locked doors. Their response, we've seen the Lord. Now, Thomas wasn't there. He says, I'm not going to believe unless I see his hands and his feet. And I put my finger in his hand and put my fist in his side. But a week later, Jesus appears again behind locked doors to the disciples. And Thomas sees and he says, my Lord and my God. That's the point. And now the disciples, when they realize who it is talking to them on the shore, they respond in our passage. They know it's the Lord. And by the way, the very next section, Jesus is going to restore Peter, who denied Jesus three times. Three times he's going to restore Peter. Peter, do you love me? And three times Peter's going to respond, yes, Lord. Do you see what's going on here? John's including this to show us Jesus has been resurrected, but He's much more than a man. This is Jesus. And they realize who it is, which, by the way, that's the point of the Gospel of John. We've pointed out over and over again throughout this passage, John's purpose is in writing. It's the last couple of verses in chapter 20. Why does he write these things to us? And we read in, in, let's go to the next slide if we can, John chapter 20. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you might have life in his name. Here's who Jesus is. He's not just a man. He's not just a miracle worker. And Jesus is not just someone that got tragically crucified and God brought him back to life. You realize who Jesus is? Jesus is the Son of God. He's our Savior. The purpose of the book of John is to remind us Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. He is the Redeemer. He's the Savior. And now he's been restored to his rightful place. Jesus has been changed, and no longer is he confined to his earthly body. Jesus has been changed completely, which, by the way, that's what Paul writes when we get to the book of Philippians. Philippians says this, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that's above every name. So the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's boss. He's in charge. You see, it's Jesus. It's the name of Jesus that every knee will bow. It's by the name of Jesus that every person will be saved. There is no other name under heaven except Jesus Christ by which man must be saved. It's Jesus Christ. And that's John's point. Jesus came and revealed himself. He showed himself for who he truly is. Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's who he is. And if you've missed that, you've missed the book of John. See, Jesus is the Lord of all. 
The question is, is he Lord of you? As we look at this passage, we need to realize that Jesus, he longs to have fellowship with you. In fact, Jesus came to live, to die, to reconcile you to himself. You need to realize that Jesus is concerned about you and your needs. Jesus wants to provide for you. In fact, when Jesus provides, he provides abundantly, more than you can ask or imagine. But what Jesus really wants to do, he wants to provide for your salvation. He wants to restore you to a right relationship with God. And so we realize Jesus wants to have that relationship. He wants to provide for you. He wants to, uh, to fill your deepest needs, the needs of salvation. He wants to do those things, but in order for Jesus to be your savior, your provider, he's got to first be your Lord. So here's what really matters. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. The question is, is he Lord of you? Would you pray with me? Father, I want to come before you and just want to thank you for the book of John and its unveiling, its revealing of who Jesus is. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is Savior. But Father, we understand for Jesus to be our Savior, he first must be our Lord. And so help us like the disciples and Mary Magdalene before us acknowledge Jesus for who he truly is. Help each tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Father, that's our prayer. Father, thank you so much for who you are and for what you've done for us. And thank you for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But thank you that more, more than that, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.